declaring the end from the beginning. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bear fruit to God that your fruit should remain. To those who are sanctified in Mashiach Yahushua, called to be set apart and calling on the name of our Yahuwah Yahushua, our Master, it is in Him we have grace and shalom. Thanks for tuning in. In the last video, we presented some pondering statements and questions, which will be unpacked a little more in this video. And for those who are serious truth seekers, it is my hope that more thoughts will be awakened that will bring about more questions and ultimately drawing you to a more intimate knowledge of our Maker. And if you're looking for clarity, feel free to reach out. My email address is included in the description box below. Let's pick up from the last question that we ended with in the last presentation. Why does a circular tabernacle spiritually and physically matter? Scripture tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. The idea of tabernacle seems a minute point in the grand scheme of things. But is it really? Why should we not depend on what we see or perceive? Well, research shows that even before birth, up until the age of seven or so, a child's brain develops more than at any other time in life. In these early years, our brain development has a lasting impact on our ability to learn and how we perceive life in general. Now, what we experience with our five senses in the first few years, good or bad, shapes and molds a big chunk of who we are and what makes up our belief system. Walking by faith and not by sight is a principle of surrender to unlearn the falsehood of our identity that was insidiously weaved into this world system. So how we see ourselves is largely based on our belief of who we are. And so the false narrative that has been fed to us since birth needs to be corrected. So the word of Yahuwah, tabernacle among us, is the Father's loving instructions in order that He may dwell with us. Just like Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 says, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. The first mention of the intent behind building the tabernacle of Moses is back in Exodus 25 verse 8, where Yahuwah says to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And in verse 9, it says, According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Paul in Galatians 3.24 likens the law, the Father's loving instructions to a tutor to bring us to Mashiach that we might be justified by faith or that we would find ourselves in the right standing of the perfect will of the Father. And all this is done by faith. Now, this is not blind faith. The word faith in Greek is pistis, defined as conviction of the truth of anything belief, strong and welcome conviction. So no matter the number of years you've been around this planet, credentials that hang on your walls or doctorate attached to your name, no matter how heavyweight your knowledge or experience is, no amount of earthly treasures will change the fact that your ability to perceive, behold, or see within the entirety of the universe, let's call that the electromagnetic spectrum, you're really only limited to comprehending less than 1% of the visible spectrum. So there are really more to what meets the eye. And this is why our Messiah gives us these head-scratching questions. John 3.12 says, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you 
heavenly things. In other words, he has come down to our level of limitation to teach us earthly things because through the things below will we be able to see the things above. We are to walk by faith. The earthly pattern of the tabernacle given to Moses was where the 12 tribes of Israel gathered around to congregate in. It was a visible manifestation of the presence of the Creator amongst His people. The tabernacle is also patterned after our triune nature. The gates and the veils of the tabernacle highlights the way, the truth, this progressive approach to the Most High's throne, where eternal life is sourced from. The furnishings in the holy place, the outer and inner court, serves as practical lessons about our Mashiach, leading us back to the presence of the Most High, where there is safety. The tabernacle in Exodus is also key to the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. And this is an important distinction for us to know as kingdom brides. Why is this tabernacle named specifically after David? Did you know that Moses had his own personal tent that's different from the tabernacle erected in the midst of the children of Israelites? Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebekah, they all had personal tents. Well, did you know that the Creator Himself pitched a tent for Adam in Eden? You have a personal tent for your own individual life journey. The Most High reveals things to us on a personal level. There is no one else that has ever lived since the beginning of time that had the exact iota of experience you had within our triune nature, spirit, soul, and body. And just by looking at our genetic makeup, we all have DNAs within ourselves and the science community have a good understanding of how cells work, but it is in the non-coding regions of the genome, which, by the way, accounts for approximately 98% of our DNA that scientists to this day know very little about. And yet, they do take note that there is a unique sequential genetic expression that vary in sequence. And it is in these regions that determine how you and I are different. So our individual uniqueness brings about a personal testimony, a personal scroll written about us. And this is a beautiful thing for each of us to complete in accordance to the author and finisher of our faith. It is in this discovering of who our creator is and who we are that the tabernacle serves as our loving instructions in knowing who we are in him. Him and who he is in us. It is in our personal tent that we get to exercise our individual responsibility, our response to Yahuwah's ability instilled in us to walk by faith the unique experience laid out for us within the limitations of this physical realm. And it is in this personal tent that we will understand what it means to be in the presence of the Most High, to have that face-to-face -face experience, face-to-face -face encounter in a way that we shall know just as we also are known by Him. Luke 16.10 If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. There is a very good reason as to why the Ancient of Days only allowed us to see in a mirror dimly for now. For us to know in part, with this little understanding, we have already witnessed man's capability in pursuing evil things. We've seen the extent as to the great lengths man will go to achieve its lascivious desire to self-gain, to abuse power, and to have its feebleness be consoled by the deceit of Lucifer himself and his minions to follow after his pattern of the five I wills described in Isaiah 14 because he knows his time is little and there's nothing within his nature and capability to change the victory written in advance at the end of the book 
And so the only thing he can do is keep you and I from awakening and walking our true and pure nature only found in our Mashiach. Ezekiel 28.12 gives us a glance at potentially the first occurrence of iniquity. In this context, we see a shift from the earthly prince of Tyre to the power behind the king of Tyre. Ezekiel 28.12 says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Ezekiel is referring to the pre-fallen Satan here, and what could have stirred Satan's heart to pride is this idea of seal of perfection. The meaning behind seal has to do with a fixing of one's seal or fastened or locked up. Perfection means measurement, pattern, or proportion. So Satan's creation was proportioned to the purpose of his creation. And that is to cover the throne of the Most High. His nearness to the throne likely made him second in command, closest to the presence of Yahuwah, reflecting the Creator's glory to the rest of the heavenly beings. You can imagine the level of influence he had over the congregation of angels, in that a third followed after his rebellion. This tells you that even angels have free will to choose within boundaries. After having been fastened or stationed as the second in command and still choosing to conjure up the pride of sin within a Satan, reaching the point of maturity in that iniquity was found in him. Is there any wonder why there's no mercy for their type of rebellion? 2 Peter 2, 4 says, Yahuwah did not spare angels when they sinned. Why? Well, because they have seen a lot more than what man has been able to see. Even mankind are without excuse. For since the creation of the world, the Most High's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. That's Romans 1.20. Is there any wonder why in the spirit realm there's no mercy? They have no excuse regardless because of the rebellion spearheaded by Satan. There are lessons even for divine beings that the creator is looking to unfold and he has chosen mankind made lower than the angels to showcase to the entire universe what is worthy of being crowned with glory and honor. Moreover, the Most High has determined to eradicate iniquity birthed by Satan himself by the forming of Adam in establishing the garden and fulfilling his purpose in the office of Melchizedek, which we will go in further detail at a later video. For now, are you starting to see the deep-rooted jealousy turned to hatred of a Satan towards this man Adam? What we dub as the fall of Adam just might be the way to reverse the fall of a Satan and his minions. For us to see something about our Creator's character that even angels are waiting to discover fully, we need to reconceptualize the story of Adam and Eve in our minds. Give Adam a little break and hold off in blaming him for causing sin to enter the world until you see a layer or two peeled off from this study. As children of the Most High, we are being given revelation so that we can obey. But there are secret things that belongs to Yahuwah and these are for loving reasons. One thing that's exciting and joyful about understanding our limitation to see in the natural realm is to leave us with very little choice but to fall in the arms of the Ruach HaKodesh and walk in the Spirit. This is walking by faith, by strong conviction of who we are in our Mashiach. Then there is no stopping us from achieving what has already been written for us in our personal book of life. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, I think we all get the part about not walking by sight. But there is this substance in things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Hmm. When you hope for something, there's usually substance in what you're hoping for, right? 
I mean, for example, I'm hoping to be mortgage free by this particular time frame. These hoped thoughts usually come with the imagination of what being mortgage free means and what that's like with thoughts of what you can do with the extra cash in hand, etc. So this is the substance of what is hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, you basically have collected data proving that what you are hoping for, even though you haven't seen it yet, it is proven to work because of testimony of witnesses, people you know or seen in YouTube videos who's walked and fulfilled in that mortgage debt-free journey. You've noted the similar pattern of events and decisions they made along the way. There are a number of books written about how to become mortgage-free. Simply put, faith is your state of being in the present time. And because you are under such strong conviction of the evidence at hand, every decision you make brings you a step closer to being mortgage-free. And so you act as if you're already mortgage-free. Faith is acting as if, acting as you imagine it to be. The same is true when it comes to achieving health, wisdom, and great relationships. As a man thinks, so is he. One thing worth mentioning here is that this principle holds true in imagining good or bad things. Job 3.25 says, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I say all that to make this point. Thoughts are powerful. The image you hold in your frontal lobe that's in between the front lid of your eyes, goes hand in hand, pun intended. What you imagine, you create. What you create is what you feel. What you feel is what you attract. We are made to be image bearers of the most high, but we can also be image bearers of the most low. The famous love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know just as I also am known. So whose image do you bear in your mind? Whose image you bear in your mind is also true of who you are. Who you are is whose you are. The key to knowing whose image you want to bear in mind is knowing the pattern of your likeness in the Creator Himself. The Creator has chosen to reveal His name, the sound of His name by His word. The Father gave His Son, his Ruach, because his word is the Father's expressed image. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Yah, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So because the word of Yah made this world, his word was given for this world. The word is is our key to having a face-to-face -face encounter with the Most High as Adam did in the garden. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if the Word became flesh to tabernacle among us, I think we ought to have the right image of the tabernacle. Remember the power of the image we hold in our minds. What you imagine you create. What you create is what you feel. What you feel is what you attract physically. What's amazing about imagining is this. We can imagine to our heart's content. There is no limit to imagining so long as you have the raw data to imagine with. Imagining is free. It doesn't cost you the world's currency. Imagining only requires the energy currency of the breath of life, the most high breathed into our nostrils. The breath of life is renewable energy. All you need to do is go to sleep and you're restored the next day. That sounds a lot like the healing benefits of the tree of life in Revelation 22 too. In the middle of its street and on the other side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The breath or the nashama of the Most High is the spirit of the Creator Himself, face to face, with our spirit. So our spirit man can be inspired to energize our soul. And so our soul is being converted 
to the truth of who we are, creating shalom or peace that can be experienced in our physical body. This is true no matter the reality of the depravity you are enduring in this world. There is fullness of joy to the point where you are experiencing heaven on earth. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So it is in the entering and experiencing eternity in your heart now is where fullness of joy can be present. And how does having the pure image of the tabernacle of the testimony of Yahusha in us spiritually and physically matter? Well, let's see what we can learn from the story of Stephen introduced in Acts 6. Stephen, whose name, by the way, means crowned, is a faithful man of Yahuwah in Acts 7.59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on Yah and saying, Master Yahusha, receive my spirit. Here's something to consider. In surgical procedures, which by the way, we practice our faith in more so than a lot of what's written in the word. There's this man-made medical capability called general anesthesia. And how it works is that it interrupts nerve signals in our brain and body that prevents our brain from processing pain and from remembering what happened during one's surgery. I now want to relate this man-made capability to turn off the pain signals that our brain receives to feel pain to how we typically normally react when we hear the story of Stephen. So our first reaction after reading or hearing about the stoning of Stephen is, oh, poor Stephen, must have hurt a lot. And you know, we applaud him for his courage and faith. And this is not to take away from the pain that Stephen humanly felt, not just at the stoning, but think about the rejection that he received. That inflicts pain too. And here's just something to consider. Is it not within the able hands of the Most High to strengthen Stephen and give him the ability by his strong conviction and knowing fully well that to live is Mashiach and to die is gain to a point where his physical body responded to this intimacy of being oneness with Mashiach that pain signals are being interrupted so he is not able to feel pain to the same extent or if any at all and as the windows of heaven open to receive his spirit is it not within the power of the breath, the neshama of the Most High breathed into Stephen that he had the ability to not only overwrite his brain neurons to a point where there's absolutely no ill feelings or ill thoughts towards the crowd who insulted him, rejected him, and physically attacked him. And not only that, but replace the normal human reactions and instead utter thoughts of forgiveness. So much so that this account of his testimony and death and his last words went on record at the end of Acts 7 verse 60, where it says, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Master, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. His act of faith was so strongly felt that it left an impression to Paul. And he recalls this after his conversion. If you can imagine being in Stephen's place in those last moments, knowing how we are when we experience rejection, when we experience persecution, what would be our instant reaction, let alone the reflex words that would come out of our mouth? Stephen's mentality was so fixated to the things that are above that his reflexive reaction is one that is founded upon mercy and truth. In the next presentation, we will look intently as to how mercy and truth is made to perfectly fit within the tabernacle of our testimony in Yahushua. Until next time, be still and know. 
Harmony at Home gives thanks to the Most High God Yahuwah for you who has chosen to listen to this video. Subscribe if you haven't already and share this work of faith and labor of love, all of which is done in the sight of our Abba Yah and patience of hope is in our Master Yahushua HaMashiach that those who hear may be encouraged continually to search the word by the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you.